we like to start with background. So tell me a little bit about where you came from. Where were you born? All right, so I was born in, uh, I was born in Athens, Greece. So that's, uh, you know, I, was, I moved here when I was six. And uh, we moved to Virginia first, uh, kind of northern Virginia, where my mom was from. Um, and, uh, and then I kind of lived there for about nine years. I went to um, elementary school there. Um, Did you have any siblings? No siblings, only child. Very spoiled. <laughs> <laughs> and what did your parents do? Uh, my my mom was a, a top model in Greece. She's uh, she, you know, traveled with my grandfather, who was in the American embassy for forty years, and so she wound up loving Greece and moving there. And on her own, without her, you know, uh, parents' full permission, she like wanted to stay there. So she made a career of becoming a model. And I grew up kind of seeing my mom on the cover of every magazine uh, at the newsstand so it was pretty awesome and my my dad was a was a serial sort of failed entrepreneur I guess you could say I mean he, he, he had these really great businesses that would rise and and then they would have spectacular falls <laughs> so so that's that's what my parents did my, my dad was a building contractor and he also ran a sock factory and some stuff like that and tell me how your father influenced you uh, my father influenced me many ways um, uh, you know, when, when I was a kid, um, you know, we were very close. So, uh, you know, he's like kind of the, the, the perfect, like, dad who's your friend kind of deal, you know? Like, it, it was more about being your friend. And we would ski together and hunt together and, you know, do all kinds of really, really fun stuff like this. Um, so he, you know, I think um, he kind of implanted a lot of adventure uh, into my mind. Uh, of course, you know. <laughs> yeah. There, was, mean, a, there yes. was a time um, when he was living. Was it in Canada? Where was he living? Because you got. He oh moved. yeah. Well, I, I when I was living in in, in Virginia, uh, he my parents uh, got a divorce, and so he moved to New York, or he was living in New York already when this happened, and um, and uh, I would f actually fly up to visit him. So he was starting this uh, this building contracting business, and it was really really exceptional to be a kid, like eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, you know, flying to Manhattan every weekend, just about every other weekend, whatever the story was, um, and landing at LaGuardia Airport and like knowing the entirety of the United Airlines crew and like, you know, going into this crazy city uh, and then kind of hanging out with him, going to his building projects and sort of seeing them progress every two weeks. Um, you know, which is an awesome way to see a, pro a construction project progress because if you watch it every day, it's pretty boring. Uh, it doesn't move very much. But every two weeks, it's like new rooms and new walls have gone up and major things have happened. So for a little boy, it was kind of an incredible And I love the story you shared with me of going to the bank to make deposits and pretending the deposit slips were checks. And yeah, and I wanted to be a businessman. So I, I you know, I like, uh, you know, would show up and I'd take all the office supplies and I'd, you know, I'd go to the bank and like, you know, this little check stuff. I don't know if they use them anymore, but they used to have these like deposit slips and I treated those as checks. So I put them in my checkbook and then I had <laughs> anything that looked like a credit card. I'd like get a wallet and I'd put it in there and I'd walk around pretending I was, I don't know, buying things. I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And you learned a great lesson from your father. I think it was your, your first entrepreneurial adventure. Yeah, so when we were first living in, in Virginia, I had like a, a, I don't know what was wrong with me, but I really liked uh, the idea of, I mean, I was really into making money or something. I really loved it. So, uh, you know, I wanted to have a lemonade stand. Everything was about how to create my next kind of thing. So I have this lemonade stand, and I'm out in the front, and I'm, I don't know what price to set it at, so I'm selling lemonade for 10 cents. Uh, I'm selling some lemonade. Not that much lemonade, but some lemonade. I'm pretty proud of myself. I made like, you know, two bucks or something. <laughs> and... <laughs> And I come inside, and my, my dad says, you know, you gotta, you gotta pay your mom for the lemons, because you, you know, because you got them from the kitchen, and your mom got them from the store, so you gotta, you know, you should pay your mom for the lemons. He didn't actually make me give her the money, which would have been really, because it would have been mean. But, uh, you know, he definitely really made me think about that, and it, it really messed me up on entrepreneurship. To be honest, it was like kind of, it messed me up on entrepreneurship, bro. Like, it's in the kitchen. I can't. This is, I was six. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, that's and, um, and then you had several other exciting entrepreneurial adventures when you were young. Yeah, so I mean everything from there it turned into like, uh, you know, everybody does the lawn. I don't know the lawn mowing businesses, the car wash businesses. I kind of went by the time I was ten. I could, 
I took that to a bit of an extreme because like it, I had friends and they work for me. Cause yeah, but <laughs> you're, you're saying it in such a mean way. The, I'm not trying to be mean. No, because it, it's yeah. such a beautiful story. And it's yeah. a, you're on the bus and the kids want to make money. Yeah, they want to make money, but I, I felt bad always because I, I knew that they could make more money if they yeah, just didn't have me. Yeah, but you gave them an opportunity. <laughs> but you gave them an opportunity to but make money because you yeah. said, okay, they want jobs. Yeah. You went to every door in the neighborhood and said, you said you'd work for free for them, didn't you? Well, no, I would, I would like do the job. I, I, I would go around and I'd basically generate leads. So I would knock on the doors and I'd get to know everybody. And then sometimes they let me wash their car or mow their lawn. Didn't matter to me. Um, and I would essentially then know which houses would do that. So I knew all the people. And, and at some point, I didn't want to keep doing that much work. And so I started to extend that out, selling the leads off to my friends. I'd go to the door with the friend. I'd say, hey, you know, with my friend, I'd arrange how much of my cut would be. And then they would do the work. I'd kind of start it off, but then I'd tell them I had another house I had to go do. So then another friend would show up and <laughs> they would do that. But they all got jobs. <laughs> yeah, they all got jobs. Yeah. But I knew that if they just did the first part themselves. But they didn't, and I they felt probably little, felt never little, would have. That's probably, yeah, but I didn't know that. I was say eight, eight yeah, or nine. Yeah, that's a gift. <laughs> um, and then my favorite, you have to share the necklaces story, because I think that, you know, I remember getting my MBA and learning about price discrimination, and, and I love your, your early pricing model. Yeah, so, so then uh, so I saw some people making necklaces, um, like beaded necklaces. So I started making these necklaces. Um, and I went and I wanted to go buy the, the beads. My mom took me to the bead store. She, I didn't know, she didn't know why I was doing this. And, uh, and what I found interesting was that there was a few kids that were making, like they wanted beaded necklaces, but they wanted certain colors. So I would make them the certain colors and I'd give those away to them for free because they were kind of cooler kids that everybody else kind of followed uh, a little bit. And, um, and then that would sell uh, more uh, necklaces to other kids because they wanted to be like Scott or whatever, right? So. <laughs> Um, so, um, and then I would sell the, if I, like if Scott's necklace was like, he, he specifically Scott wanted like <laughs> black and yellow and red. And so, um, you know, if you wanted one that was that color, I would, it was more expensive. <laughs> <laughs> so that I was 11, I think at that point. <laughs> awesome. Then people of course caught on and made their own beaded necklaces, but. Yes. And then there were, then there were official businesses. So take us to the day before the internet exists, but. So, you yeah, right. So, yeah. so then, there's, then there's the Netherworld uh, BBS. So like I'm 12 years old and um, my parents got, my, my mom got me a, a, a computer. Um, it was like an IBM kind of 386 SX40 is what it was. I don't know if you guys, but anyway. Um, and, um, and that allowed you to pretty much play Doom. And that was pretty awesome because Doom was like the early, you know, first person shooter. And that was really exciting. And, um, and I learned that there was BBSs. They got me a modem later on. So I put the modem in and then I wanted like numbers to dial in. So I, I find this BBS that was really, really small, but I really, really liked it because I liked some of the people on it. And you could play multiplayer Doom on it. It's so like early Xbox. You could play with four people. That was it. And, um, and in order to kind of like do that, I actually had to learn a lot about networking hardware and, and, and stuff like this because it would just disconnect and it wouldn't work right and you know, modems were really, you know, they weren't broadband or whatever. So um, it taught me a tremendous amount about um, how to upgrade my own computer, how to like buy parts and I started getting like really geeky about it because we couldn't afford many of these things because they were expensive like 16 megabytes of RAM. I don't know if you guys know what that sounds like. Uh, was five hundred dollars, <laughs> so sixteen. I'm not that old. I swear. Uh, <laughs> it happened all really fast. I mean, I'm I'm 32 uh, tomorrow, um, and uh, yeah. So this is like 1990, uh, 1993 or so. I'll be louder. Yes. Um, so this is 1993, and. Computer parts are really expensive, and I don't know what my point is. My point is that um, I joined the Netherworld BBS, and um, it we grew it very fast. I mean, I, I took kind of a leadership position in it. But you're 12, so how I'm are you 12, taking I, a leadership position? Well, because I told them I was 20. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so they I don't know why they believed it. I guess I I 
could kind of pull it off. And I don't think they really cared because at this point I I was um, one of the best gamers on the on the network. I was playing Doom really really well, and to the point where people had like I was 13 at, uh, just about 13 at this point, and people had to dial in to play this kid. So that was helping a lot with the BBS because it was kind of marketing that you have to dial in this place because you couldn't dial. It was long distance. It's a little different world, but long distance, you would dial into these BBSs and it would be like a $700 phone bill at the end of the month. You know, so you can only dial local, but people would dial long distance to play with me. So, I don't know. That's a lot of story there. So but what was up with the N key? Tell me about the different levels. Yeah, so I found, uh, this is kind of the first time I really ran into community and, uh, you know, um, I uh, really got way more invested due to some personal things that were going on in my life into this BBS. I kind of found it to be a solace for me. Um, and uh, a lot of the people on there really became my much closer friends than people that I was meeting in, in real life. And I got really invested in it. So I started the news. And so BBSs back then, you didn't have a mouse. You just like would hit the key for where you wanted to go. So like G was for the game area and F was for the file forums. and you know, N was for the news, which is what I made. And the news was sort of a center of the community. It was like a, a newspaper. Um, and Spelled N-E-W-Z. That's right, way. yeah. <laughs> and, um, and I would talk trash, basically, about the other players. And this, made, <laughs> and this made the Netherworld kind of way more popular than the other BBSs because it was the only one that really offered a sense of community and a sense of belonging. And, you know, your name was going to be in the paper. And, and this really stuck to me. Like I, I was like, wow, this is, this, the popularity of this thing grew a lot the more people's names I put into this newspaper. Um, and uh, the more friends I had and the more people I got to know and the more my reputation was sort of growing inside of that network. It just felt very fulfilling <coughs> to be there. And how did your school life compare to what I guess I should call your professional life? Well, so at this point in time, I started designing Doom maps. and. Um, and so like Doom was this game, and I would make these maps. And so school turned into a really great time to do that. Um, and sleep, because I was up till 5 in the morning actually making the maps. So, so I didn't, uh, school was very hard for me, generally. Like I had a very hard time concentrating in school. My mind was always wandering. I'd read like a paragraph, and you know, it kind of creates an image, and I start following that instead. It's mm -hmm. still true these days, but yeah, and, school. And what ended up being? the end of your involvement with the Netherworld? Well, I moved uh, from um, my mom's uh, boyfriend at the time. He, he got like a job opportunity for IBM up in New York. And I moved uh, to go do, you know, to go obviously with, be with them because I was a minor. And uh, I was very upset about this, like tremendously upset about this. So my, you know, for a little while they let me kind of log in a long distance and it, the $700 phone bills mounted up until I ultimately couldn't log in anymore, which was tragic and horrifying to me because I had really built, now this BBS had grown from 12 phone lines when I'd logged in to 42 phone lines. It was winning awards. It was the test bed for id Software to launch Quake. It was, uh, let's see, it was, um, it, it had a T1 connection so you could log in and log out. We'd finally gotten internet access. I, this is just absurd, but these BBSs were local, and when you actually finally got a pipe in that would let you go out to the internet, it was kind of awesome because then you could start doing internet gaming and stuff. I was pretty excited about the future of it. I thought we could really build it into a much bigger business, but after I left, it, it died soon after. So how does the next business idea come about, and, and how old are you when you, when you move? So, so I'm, I'm now 14, um, and I'm living in P uh, Poughkeepsie, New York. Uh, Poughkeepsie on a farm. Like there was a horse next door, and it was different um, than Virginia. Um, and uh, the, you know, I guess the, the next idea was really because I, I, there was a girl. The, my the bus ride is really long to get to school. I was going to this private school; is about an hour long bus ride. Um, so uh, that um, there was a really pretty girl that would get on the bus, and she really liked music tremendously. So. Uh, I really like commu computers tremendously. These things were not the same. <laughs> um, so uh, I built the, my first version of DMusic, which was my next company eventually, started off as a, as a project to sort of uh, bridge the gap between her and I. And, 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 um, and so I, I, it was DMusic, it was like a band archive. And what we would do is 
uh, we would make a, a fan page for every single band. And I literally started making a band page in HTML, which I learned very quickly to do this. Um, you know, uh, for like, I think I'd made a page for like 90 or 100 bands or something like that by the time I was exhausted. And so, and every band, she got to like give commentary and her opinion about what she thought about Alice in Chains or Nirvana or whatever. <laughs> and, um, and that was the beginning of it. Um, but um, at this point, I wanted to impress her with uh, the actual music you could get on computers because you didn't have iTunes and you didn't have these types of things. And we had MIDI files, and MIDI files were dreadful. They sound they sound dreadful by comparison to real, you know, they're synth synthetic sound. They're uh, uh, synthesized from uh, a computer, and um, and so I played some tracks for her in this, and I was like, look, computers also have music, and she was not impressed. So. <laughs> Um, so this is 1994, the Fraunhofer Institute um, in Germany released the MP3, uh, MPEG-3 uh, 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 technology. Um, and uh, that's MP3s, and, and you can encode real CDs into MP3s. So this is where things get kind of interesting, because um, I basically was one of the first people to download an MP3, because I was in this unbelievable hunt to find a better thing, because she was making fun of my computer, and you just can't make fun of a dude's computer at this point in time. It's not, <laughs> it's not cool. So um, I, <laughs> I find this MP3 of a Nirvana track, no less, and I download it, and, um, and she likes it. And I'm like, wow, this is great. So she goes, well, what about this other song? I'm like, shit. <laughs> it was like, you cannot find music on the internet. There's none of it. Um, yeah. So how, so, so how does this turn into a bigger yeah. business? Yeah, so it, it doesn't turn into a business for a while. It turns into um, essentially the world's largest music piracy network that, <laughs> that, you know. So you never wonder, like Napster, you guys have all heard of Napster? Mm -hmm. Okay. You ever wonder, like, when you down, did you download Napster? Did anybody use Napster? Okay, wow, that's amazing. Okay, great. So do you ever wonder, like, how the content that was on Napster got there? when you type something in and you were able to download something. <laughs> like, there was a lot of stuff available who actually encoded it from CDs to MP3s. USC invo was involved, that, that's for sure. You guys had a really great internet connectivity here. Um, you know, other universities around the country had uh, really great pipes. And so there was a kid, probably usually one, maybe two, uh, in every university that gave me access to an enormous amount of bandwidth. Uh, and server space on everybody's computer. So I put them all to work, which, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and we all ripped CDs like crazy. So um, then, and we didn't do this because it, we thought it was good to steal music. We, we thought it was awesome to download MP3s. It was just a different, there was, there was no criminal thought in a 15-year-old's mind you know, at this point in time. It was just that we wanted music this way. Right? That, that's all. It was as simple as that. Just we just want music this way. I don't CDs. I don't get. I want to share music through this platform with my friends who are online. Right. So um, we. Uh, long story short, um, Napster launches out of one of the chat rooms that I was helping with, um, and uh, you know Scour.net and Audio Galaxy and LimeWire and BearShare and Winamp and this whole generation of of the MP3 movement that arose uh, around me. And, um, and then we all got sued. <laughs> Basically, we all got, you know, um, I, I sold DMusic, um, which was kind of a, a front for all this stuff. It was like a place where you could learn all about the software. Yeah, and so I, long, before you, long before you get sued. Yeah, long before that. Sorry, I skipped ahead. I, so at, at 15, 16, um, I now run this blog, DMusic. I've leveraged this network called IRC, Internet Relay Chat, to build up the traffic of it and to dis you know, by distributing all this music and then putting DMusic in the title bar of the chat room for everybody. So then they would go to this place as their ultimate source for news. Um, and because I was the center of all this stuff, all the people making MP3 software, so Music Match, Zing Technology Group, and all these like venture capital funded businesses, saw me and they were like, yo, get this kid to talk about our software. So I was like, well, I can talk about your software on my blog, which is now like one of the top music sites in the world. Um, we were getting like, I don't know, 200,000 hits a day, which back then was obnoxiously, 
you know, like Yahoo, there was Yahoo, but you know, I think we had a little more traffic in like broadcast.com, which is what Mark Cuban sold to Yahoo for like $2 billion, which is how he now owns the Mavericks and all that stuff. I don't know if you guys know that story. But um, you know, we had a little bit more web traffic than, than that. So that was pretty neat. Yeah, and um, so you're, you're in school still while all this is happening. Do you want me to use I'm not talking loudly enough. OK, cool. I'll just put it right here. Great. Sorry. Is, is this better? Sorry I'm not loud enough. Um, so is this when you're in school and you have a cell phone? Uh, yeah, so at this point, um, I'm, I'm 15 years old, and I'm, I'm uh, selling advertising for these technology companies, making about $40,000 a month. And you're 15? Uh, yeah, I'm 15. <laughs> and, and it was insane, because <laughs> I didn't, you know, that was a lot of pressure. I mean, there were some months where I made less money, but there were some months where I made 40 grand a month. Um, and uh, so I got special um, treatment at school. <laughs> and you negotiated for this. I went to the principal. I think my mom was lobbying in phone calls in the background, but I was definitely going in and negotiating for, uh, people didn't have cell phones at this point in time, so most people didn't have a cell phone. If they did, it was like a crazy big blocky thing. Um, Nextel had just come out with a really cool piece of technology, and, uh, and I wanted to bring it to school so I could ans answer a call from advertisers. So I was allowed to leave class if it, the cell phone rang. And this is high school, so that was pretty obscene. Um, and I, got, I just got away with a lot of different things. They actually created a class for me, um, and they gave me a teacher. I, I was otherwise getting bad grades, so they didn't know what to do with me. <laughs> you know? um, and, um, what I love about yeah. the, the cell phone story, too, is that like, we can't have the phone ringing in class. And it's like, oh, no, this has a vibrate feature. Yeah, it, that it, was it had so vibrate. That was so novel. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So, so then you're getting suitors. You know, this, uh, this site has a lot of traffic, you know, yeah. more traffic than broadcast.com. I think you shared that it was like a top 20 most trafficked site. Yeah, I don't, uh, you know, we didn't Something really have good software back then to be able to tell you uh, exactly what was going on. But 200,000 pages a day in, in 97 is like pretty So absurd. people start calling you. Yeah, so what ha you know, so then I start getting tons of phone calls. And the phone calls are from, you know, VCs, uh, from uh, independent entrepreneurs, from the other companies in the space. Um, and they, they don't want me to come with it. or They just see an asset and they want to buy it because this MP3 thing seems to be taking off. Mm -hmm. uh, and I got uh, about 10 offers for my business. Um, I was like, at this point, 16 going on 17. And I'm kind of negotiating with people who want to buy the company. My friends have built other companies and they're selling them. Uh, for we were the very big site in the space, but even the smaller sites were being sold for two hundred thousand dollars in cash, or like, you know, five hundred grand in cash, or w whatever the thing was. People were moving in with lots of money and buying things up. One of the guys was Bill Gross from Idea Lab out in Pasadena, and he was really, really hyperactive about it. So, um, you know, we were in the middle of negotiating that deal, and he wanted to buy D Music for a million dollar. No. Uh, million dollars and I think half of it, or $500,000, and it was in gold bullion. So he was going to deliver gold bullion to me. Um, and, and I said, okay, well this is all great, but I have other people offering me like $3 million and I don't understand the and difference. And you're how old again? I'm 16. Okay. So I don't understand this. Uh, this is a pretty large discrepancy. I need, to, I need to think about it. I was a really aggressive little jerk. I don't <laughs> know how I was like even you know, not trembling on the phone talking to these people because they were so serious. But I didn't know anything, so that's, uh, it, it helped me to negotiate. Um, and so what I negotiated was, look, I need to think. So I'm going to Greece. Every year I would go to Greece to visit my family. I'm you know, from Greece, and so my aunt and my cousins and stuff are there. And we would spear gun fish and do these crazy adventures, and there was no chance I was missing out on this at the age of 17. Yeah, but his, his sea adventures were very different because you were going in the water but having a computer right next yeah, to so I needed. I was like, look, I need to go to Greece, but I have this website, and it's really valuable, and it's valuable to you. So. I don't have the lap. I don't have a laptop, and I don't have a way to up. I don't have a connection in, in Greece. So you need to give me the money so that I can go continue to maintain this website while I think about your offer. <laughs> 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 right. So I get a FedEx envelope, and it has ten grand in it in cash. Twenty-four hours later, 
and because I'm leaving the two days later, and I like. I'm in my room and I dump out this cash on my bed and my mom walks in <laughs> and she's kind of a little freaked out. She's like, Angelo, what is going on here? You know, <laughs> you know, uh, and, um, and uh, well, I used the money and I, I went to, you know, he also sent me in the same package, he sent me a laptop, which is this laptop. Okay, this is I, just I brought so amazing. It in. The reason I brought it in is because I just recently had lunch with Bill Gross. And yeah, so this is like a, pr a, a portage Toshiba, like 486, like this thing, I think it could still turn on. I mean, this is something. And these were really, really expensive when he sent me this. In fact, it was his laptop. I needed it so quickly that he had his tech department clean his own laptop out. He would then buy, he was like this little jerk, I'm not gonna give him my, a new laptop, I'll send him my old one, and, <laughs> you know. And, um, and so he sent this to me and I, I go, um, I hadn't spoken to him, we didn't ultimately do the deal. This is interesting, if that's the card. I hope it is. Yeah, it was like a PCMCIA card. So then, like the the company out in Greece had one of these, and then I could connect it to a, a Nokia cell phone, and I was updating D music from this thing in my wetsuit before I would dive into the water. I was 16. It's killer. Um, <laughs> so I go have lunch with Bill like um, maybe four months ago, and I hadn't seen him in 10 years, uh, and and I I bring this with me, and I don't know how this goes back in there. It's <laughs> such old technology, I can't even believe it. Um, and I bring this thing with me, and he's, we're going towards his office as we're, he greets me in the, in the lobby, and he sees this thing, and he goes, you know, I had a laptop just like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, well, you know, Bill, that's because that's your laptop. <laughs> and, uh, and so he kind of like gets creeped out, because I think anybody should get creeped out, <laughs> right? Because he doesn't remember me, and he doesn't, so, um, so we go back and Marsha Goodstein runs, uh, you know, operations for Idealab and is also Bill's wife. And so he's like, we, we got to go talk to Marsha. So we go straight to Marsha and Marsha doesn't, she's like, I remember that. That was a crazy, anyway, and then they start talking about some business stuff. And I uh, ultimately, um, what was the point with this thing? Well, he, he may have asked whatever happened to the $10,000. Oh yeah, so then we go to lunch and he's like, <laughs> so what happened to the 10, if I, he interrupts like his like monologue to go, hey, wait a minute, like, what did I get? Like, I gave you 10 grand and a laptop. What did I get? Right? <laughs> and I go, you know, Bill, you didn't, you didn't let me finish. That was the best part of the story. You actually got nothing from a 16-year-old kid. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I got away with this thing. So, so you're getting all these offers, tons of money, cash coming in overnight packages yeah. all over your bed. I can't imagine $10,000 cash. It's everywhere. It was everywhere. wicked, yeah. And, and, and you've got about 10 other offers. And what's the offer you end up going with? I, I went with the offer, so I was kind of a, um, there's a whole byline here, but, but uh, I went with the offer that let me stay with my business. So I, you know, I wanted to, to keep working at this thing. I was so passionate about computers and so passionate about the MP3 movement and all these types of things that all these other companies were like, hey, let me buy what you've built, but get out of here, kid, you know. And I was like, no, that's not, that's not how this is going to go. So I took um, probably financially maybe the worst offer, but it was um, the best for me. Um, and, and that was with, uh, from, you know, an offer that was made from Michael Ovitz, who was, um, you know, he was the founder of CAA. He, uh, at the time that we were negotiating, he was in the cover of the the New York Times Magazine, and um, and it, he just seemed like a really fancy person, um, and and I, I was really intrigued. And of course, I was told in the negotiations, like, "Hey, man, if you come and we do this stuff, like, you're gonna do way better, and we'll, you'll get stock in lots of the businesses that we'll be investing in." And what they viewed me as is not only that they liked the business a bit, and they wanted to do more stuff in music, but they really liked that I was young that I understood the tech space that most people didn't and that I could point out what was cool and what was happening so that they could bring those companies in so that we could look at them more closely. Uh, so you take you know. the Beverly Hills Hollywood job. Yeah, they fly me out, they put me at the standard. I was still 17 and, uh, and then uh, one of his assistants, his job was uh, to drive me around. And the fanciest thing, this is where I was really sold, is The Matrix was out in theaters. So we go to the, the Fox theaters and we, we watch The Matrix and we're in the middle of the movie and like, 
you know, Michael calls and he's like, you've got a meeting now, you got to, you know, you guys have to come back. And in the middle of the movie, they're like, okay, uh, he's like, dude, we got to go because Michael wants a meeting now. And I'm like, okay, uh, cool. Um, but we paid for the movie ticket. <laughs> <laughs> and I just don't, I'm from Poughkeepsie, I don't understand, like you just, you guys are like uh, rich or something. I don't know, <laughs> this is overwhelming for me. Uh, that you would leave in the middle of a movie. I never, you know, did that. Well, speaking, so. of, speaking of money, I just have to say, I think it's really interesting that at 15, 16, you know, when you're running the site and yeah. making sometimes 40000 a month, yeah. you're just reinvesting in the business for it to grow. Yeah, that's all I cared about. I just wanted the business to grow bigger. I wanted to hire people. I wanted to make it bigger and grander. I mean, I was so passionate about this concept that everything that was made from it had to go back into it and, and I, I took a little bit out for myself but for the most part I was employing more people and you know building a staff and building a team and that was never enough I, I, kept, I wanted to keep going because I just saw so much potential. And, um, and why did you want the business to succeed? Well because now it's competing with mp3.com so you know I, I you know wanted to <coughs> what did I want it to succeed personally? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Personally. Um, you know that's a good question I, I I, um, I had a, um, uh, I just, um, I kind of loved the notion of building communities and having people around me that I could, I like networks, you know, and I, I was fascinated by networks. I was massively amused by, how could you not be? I mean, you're really dealing with the first so social networking software and people at scale out of your like bedroom as a kid, you know, mm -hmm. and it was it was a crazy experience. I mean, the the rush was. Uh, I don't know if that's what you're asking, though. No, I think that's great. I think the other thing, just as a mom, that really touched me, yes. hearing you tell the story, was that you really wanted to provide for your family. Yes. And for your mom and and the situation. And yeah, yeah. Th well, there was a situation. So when, when I was 13, um, uh, my father passed away. So at that point, um, you know. I don't know if you remember, but that's like right after necklaces and right in the middle of Netherworld before I took it really seriously. So like when I was still making maps versus when I was, uh, you know, writing the news and building community. So I, I, I don't know. I think it, I think it was just um, I think it was just having people around me. You know. Yeah, I think. That was great. And also you shared with me that you really didn't like your, your mom's boyfriend at the time. Yeah, yeah I, di I didn't and like her And you wanted her yeah. to, to be able to have the freedom right. to... Yeah, I mean, you have a lot of that um, stuff going on. I mean, and, you know, I, I felt a little... I felt um, being 13 and, and losing your father is really difficult, and you feel uh, a sense of insecurity. Um, so... Um, so anyway, security is something that you pursue at that point, <laughs> very, very intensely, you know, more so than, than anybody that was around me. So I couldn't really relate to a lot of people around me because they couldn't understand what I was going through. And I got to meet, the people on these networks were just older than me. They were not 13. They were 17, 20, 25. They were more mature. And I, I loved building these huge communities in which, even though I was much younger, uh, I could really stand out, and I could bring people around me that I needed. And you were a leader. Sense. Right, yeah. You, there's no doubt about I, that. You, you also, at the age of 13, uh, 14, 15, going through the things that you're going through as you're becoming an adult, um, you know, I think you crave control, you know, because when, you know, there's nothing your mom can do, there's nothing anybody can do when your father passes away the way that my father passed away. My, my father um, committed suicide. So um, there's, there's no one that can tell you that that's you know, going to be OK, if that makes sense. Um, so um, now you'd overcome so much. You yeah. built something so huge. Yeah. And you're living in Hollywood. And you've got models and actors and talent and the best musician and the biggest CEOs coming and they want to hear what you have to think. Right. So what does that feel like? Well, it, 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 um, it feels amazing. It's also scary as hell, right? Because you're actually a kid and you're, <laughs> you're, you're 18 and uh, you're in the middle of this and you're definitely now way in over your head. There's no question, <laughs> you know? I mean, yes, I can point at GameSpy and say that was a cool company or point at like Ask Jeeves and think that was kind of entertaining or 
things that I thought were cool at that moment. But when those CEOs came in, you know, and I wanted to bond with them, like there was, I, that was a world, I mean, you know, these are very serious, very powerful, very effective people. Um, and so are the people that I'm working with uh, at AMG, uh, with, uh, with Michael and, and 260 managers uh, who are, you know, managing Cameron Diaz and Leonardo DiCaprio and, you know, and, uh, you know, I don't know who the hell, it was like a ridiculous roster of people, um, Buster Rhymes and Missy Elliott and, you know, um, all these types of things. And so being in that, in that environment of unbelievable uh, talent uh, and incredibly professional people, you know, being 18, I didn't really fully feel like I was treated like I was 18. And, and, and it was an intense world and it was a bit of a shark tank and it was intense as all hell. And uh, I loved every second of it and it scared the crap out of me. And it was great. <laughs> and some of the investments, I think you were telling us about them yeah. before. So what are some, so this is the big world of MP3s now and yes, yes. Scour and Napster. And so what are some of the investments that Michael and so, Link Technology Group make? So we, we make an investment, it's a, right as, as I'm arriving, we're investing in Scour.net, which was basically a competitor to Napster. Uh, very, very big, although it also permitted um, for you to download movies and TV shows and not just music. Uh, so this is like a, a, a ticking time bomb that goes off about eight months later as we get sued for a quarter of a trillion dollars, which was intense. A quarter of a trillion dollars is a very large lawsuit. Everybody's very upset about this. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and the internet's very scary, you know, and this is really, as if you keep watching this, the, the dot-com crash happens probably um, a year and a half after I arrive uh, to AMG. So, um, so it's like lawsuits and uncertainty and all these other things and instability and basically this new platform, the internet, which is supposed to reshape and reconfigure media, but in fact, uh, it just isn't going to be that simple. You know, uh, media companies disagree. <laughs> and so, and what ends up happening with you and the Ovitz world? Uh, uh, so, I end up um, uh, staying there for about two years. Uh, we saw, I think it was a few hundred companies came in. And it was amazing because I would point at a company. The CEO would come in, the management team would come in. Afterwards, we'd see uh, financial statements. I'd have access to Michael's MBAs and, and lawyers, and they'd explain everything to me. And that was the best part of that experience for me because I didn't go to school. Uh, I hadn't gone to college. I hardly finished, I mean, I finished high school, but, you know. <laughs> uh, and, um, and so it was kind of my education. It was an incredible thing because I got to pick the companies, and then I got to look inside the hood, so my enthusiasm for the material was extremely high, and I vacuumed all that up. Um, and then I was kind of, uh, in my mind, I was ready to take a few minutes off, and I went to Greece for a couple months, and then I came back to one of the most daunting kind of financial circumstances I'd ever encountered, because none of these investments really had panned out. Um, everything, the dot-com crash happened, I was wrapped up in that, and you know, I literally, you're looking, I'm 21 now, and, or 20, 19, 20, yeah. And um, I have about $10,000 in the bank. Um, I, I have no stock in anything, really. And it's really like, for the first time ever, just blank. And it's, everything is very uncertain and because, very insecure. Yeah, because you had equity in the Ovitz endeavor, but that was folding and right D music survived it got acquired for a small amount of money uh, by a guy in Pennsylvania and my first gig out immediately afterwards was to sort of help him with the property a bit and that kind of gave me some income but I'd never had a job right and and I I never worked at anything for anyone and I was very uncertain about that notion it was just really discomforting to me um, and because I didn't have a degree and because they tell you that, you know, if you don't have these things that, that um, it's going to be very hard to get a job or do whatever, um, that world was really scary. So I needed to stay in my world because that was getting overwhelming. I start looking uh, at, at um, okay, cool, yeah. I start looking at, um, you know, schools. Uh, I start filling out, I think I turned that off. No? <laughs> 
I'm not very good with this. Oh, I think I turned it back on. <laughs> okay. Um, I start looking at schools, and and uh, I've got my applications filling, you know, that I'm filling out. But I've started with a few of the same friends from D Music. We've started Deviant Art, and and what's your lifestyle like at this point? So you've got ten thousand dollars only in the bank. Yeah. And so I um, nothing to show for everything right. because you <laughs> took the offer that allowed you to stick with the company and got a salary that no longer exists. So I come back from Greece. I don't have a place to live. I crash with my mom and her studio and I break my arm here at USC playing basketball and I'm on like pain meds and I got a cast on and I've got nothing <laughs> like I'm just I mean not that 10 grand is 10 grand is definitely not nothing actually it's 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 a lot and I'll, I'll explain why but you have to work really hard against it uh, to make it something so um, just a lot of uncertainty and a lot of insecurity, which if you can imagine, I'm, I'm now, I'm 20 and I'm looking back at my life now and I'm realizing like, wow, you know, these things that happened when I was 13, I have a lot of insecurity generally and then this moment is just dark, man. I mean, you know, the first number of years, because I obviously chose to go with DeviantArt uh, and I put the applications away, you know, because um, DeviantArt was growing fast. Um, you know, it was the, it was crazy. We we literally built DeviantArt during the dot com crash. You cannot get investors. You cannot get support. Everybody thinks you're crazy that you're building an internet entertainment property, and um, and we didn't hear from. It was completely silent in technology for like the first two years. Nobody rang. Nobody cared. Nobody called. There was no hype. There was nothing. Just the volume inverted on the internet. No one wanted to talk about it. It was like a sore loss for everybody. Um, and, and man, did that align with me. You know, like that, I feel like I mirror that graph. You know, that's how, kind of how I felt. <laughs> if you look at that stock market graph, that's pretty much my emotional graph at that moment. Um, and, um, and yeah, that's kind of, that brings us to DeviantArt, I suppose. Yeah, and you know, I don't know if you're comfortable sharing this, but in your personal life, you know, you get really bad news at the same moment. Yeah, right around, so I'm living with two of my friends, which is the best part about it, David and Eric, and um, these guys are a little older and, and they're like bigger brothers even to this day, so I'm living with them, um, I'm trying to make this company work, I'm eating tuna fish, basically, I mean, I'm on a really, really regimented budget, because I got a mission, you know, I've got to make this company work, I have to make this company work, I have nothing but fear, I have an incredible need for control because that is something that was implanted in me young and, and I needed to control the world because if I didn't then things could go drastically wrong is what I'd learned. Um, and, uh, and, um, and so, um, and then my mom uh, is diagnosed with cancer uh, and that was hard. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm like 22 at this point. But we have happy news on that front because your Man. mom is here. Yes, she is. <laughs> Uh, my mom is here, and she's doing great. So it, it all turned out great. Yes. Yay. <laughs> but you don't know what, I mean, you don't know what to do. I mean, you're like, a, there's, I mean, your mom's very preoccupied <laughs> with this situation, and I'm calling the family back in Greece, and it's just my mom and I, and that's who's here, and that's it. America is my mother and myself. That's, you know, what I have. I also have my friends and the things that I've done. Um, but boy, that really uh, was intense. And, and so, you know, I'm kind of um, working on now, in addition, I'm also kind of like crashing in the hospital room for like at Cedars, you know, for like two weeks at a time or whatever the story was, you know, and, and, um, uh, and, and helping as much as I can uh, through that. Fortunately, my mother at this time had this, you know, really fantastic man in her life, uh, Sherwin, who um, <laughs> it's a tough one because he then uh, passed away from cancer. But sorry if I'm getting emotional. It's just a kind of a, a lot. Um, <clears throat> so um, he was awesome, right? Because he really took the position of um, of like a real uh, man, you know, in, in somebody's life. Um, we don't have yeah, sorry, that. sorry. Yeah, no, it's good. <laughs> and you're amazing. And, yeah. and you're a sweetheart. And that's why you're born on Valentine's Day. Right, right. Birthday tomorrow. 
Um, so Sher Sherwin's awesome, and he really handles this situation uh, beautifully, um, and takes care of my mom, and, and does all this wonderful stuff. So that, that's kind of um, what's happening in parallel to the begins, beginnings of DeviantArt. But in addition to that, um, you know, we have raised uh, from a couple of friends roughly uh, $17,000 in funding. And that is what we had from the year 2000 until the year 2007. And in 2007, we raised money from a company called Divix. I don't know if you guys know Divix. It was a popular encoding format. My friend Jordan, who was at mp3.com running artist relations. Having friends is really good. Um, you know, uh, was like, yo, I'll, I'll, I know your story. I know what's up here. DeviantArt's a beautiful thing. Um, gave me a fantastic deal. Um, and so I took it. We raised three and a half million dollars. We already had 40 employees. So I built a business with this incredible group of people, Chris Bolt and Andrew and, um, you know, um, uh, even Scott and, and some of the, the, um, the early staff spot and, and these folks, we built this incredible business through an incredible amount of passion. I mean, Spot, no one was, I mean, the, the amount of money <laughs> that we were getting paid or not paid, I mean, literally, I was having people who were so passionate about the project, and I needed them, and I think it was a lot of me being in the middle, like, needing this, convincing absolutely everybody around me that we were going to get there. And... Um, Spot slept in a closet in his cousin's house, literally, like, next to the bathroom. That was his room for about a year and a half, right? This kind of level of dedication is what I had around me. Uh, and in 2007, 40 employees, we had, uh, you know, three or four million dollars in revenue. And to originally get it started, you know, share with us... No, 1.8 million in revenue, sorry. Share, no. share with us the vision in the beginning. So. People upload, you know, you're creating a community. What was the vision? What was the desire? And, and how is this so different from what you saw at, at AMG with Michael Ovitz? Oh, so um, it, was an, it was a very, uh, there was a program called Winamp. Winamp was how you listened to your MP3s. I built Winamp Facelift. So Winamp Facelift w was how you would get skins for Winamp so you could make it look cool. I met artists. Uh, on Winamp Facelift, as did our, our other co-founders have a different story. My story is Winamp Facelift, so, so um, you know, for them it was that they built other skin sites, but for all of us it was that there was this software movement and there was really cool designers and artists who were making these pieces of software look great. And I built Winamp Facelift, it was huge, and then Customize.org was built and it was by the guy that built Winamp Facelift for me in exchange for server resources for a new project, right? And so Mark launches customize.org. The next, you know, three months later, kills the thing he built for me on my servers. So he, <laughs> so he launches this thing, and, um, and then ultimately DeviantArt was the same concept, but instead of just skins, the artists on these platforms were saying, hey, we'd love to post our paintings, we'd love to post our photographs you know, not just our skins, which we have all these things, and so we built the platform that would allow you to create categories dynamically uh, based on community response and feedback. And this crushed, and you know, so now Mark can take that, because, you know. <laughs> so, so how did you get, so how did you create community around this? So, so the, it, was, it was beautiful, like the homepage is the same as it is today. You would post your work and your art would make it to the homepage. So you could be on the homepage of a website which was a completely brand new concept. Uh, you could have an account on a website, which was uh, pretty new as a concept. You could have a profile page, which was a brand new concept uh, on a network. You could customize that page with your own profile information and photos. You could then post media, which was a brand new concept. So you couldn't post photos on any website back then. Um, and, uh, and then you could comment on the work that was posted. So it would appear on the home page, which means people would be driven to you with traffic in the newest feed. We had a popular feed that would show you what was happening today, what was popping. And, and, uh, and our, our team uh, was dedicated to commenting on every single piece of art submitted. So we, we had, um, I don't know, one submission, one comment, or 10 on that day, because we all posted on the first one. And then, uh, you know, by the time you get to 100 posts to the site per day from a growing kind of small little community, we would comment on every single piece. 
and positively, constructively, like, hey, man, this is really great, or this is uh, awesome you know, stuff, and you're very talented. And, and the concept captivated these like, legendary artists who were very mysterious. So there was a guy named Misery, and Misery posted the coolest, of course his name was Misery. So, <laughs> so uh, he posted the like, absolutely most amazing digital art anybody had ever seen. And um, he didn't post anywhere. He just occasionally would drop a bomb, and like it would be like the most amazing thing anybody seen. So um, he he uh, he sanctioned this as the place to be. Like this guy said, you know, here's my account, here's all my work, posted his stuff, and that made everyone turn their heads. And so it created, you know, this effect where all, all artists around the world started telling all artists around the world that this is where you should be. And, um, and we encourage it simply by being open-minded, by, by posting some of our you know, founders. Mattia was an incredible uh, tutorial creator and you know, Photoshop um, you know, um, just mastered. Like he's just, he had the killer website called Wasted Youth. And, and so we had our roots in the community, but, but really it was that uh, we were met halfway and that, that the best of the best kind of said, yeah, this is where we're going to hang out. And, um, you know, when we grew to 1,000 people posting every day, um, we kind of started getting stretched. And by 3,000 people posting every day, we got really stretched in terms of commenting on every single thing from our little team. And so we realized that we had to create culture. So we had to create a culture where our members would comment on our members' work. And the way that we did that was, well, first of all, it's deviant art. So if you're a member, you're a deviant. And if you post a work of art, it was a deviation. And we love this little kind of game that we would play with this network. So to be truly devious, to win the deviousness award on a monthly basis, uh, or to get a daily deviation, uh, you would have to um, embody the spirit of DeviantArt. And so at the very bottom of the website, we put DeviantArt loves you, which was bold as a statement. It still is. But it sent a very clear, very parental sort of message. It sent a a message of community, a message of embracing uh, these, this, this community. Um, and and we, would, we would constantly reinsert that into the network. So we'd write these hot topics, and we would tell the community, like, hey, this is what, it's, this is what it is to be a deviant. This is what it's not to be a deviant. You know, this person saying this stuff, you know, that's, that's not cool. This person, saying, this person saying is this stuff, and this stuff is cool. You should follow this person and not this approach. We stood up like leaders, and we really drove that culture to become what we wanted it to be. And we fought very hard uh, over the next two, three, four years to make sure that it stayed intact in similar ways. And it got increasingly difficult because the site you know, exploded. I mean, we've been a top 100 internet property for a decade, right? It's insane. It's crazy. <laughs> and, and I think you shared with me that there was never a Monday that wasn't a bigger Monday than the prior Monday. Yeah, it's still the same case. I mean, DeviantArt uh, reaches a new traffic record roughly every, well, it depends on the time of the year. When people are in school, uh, you know, it's, uh, there's a demo proportion of our demographic that people go to school. So uh, these days, it's actually our Saturdays and Sundays. Our Sundays are our biggest days. But in the summers and in other times off, it's the, week, the weekdays. So, um, but every week we had a traffic record. And how does DeviantArt make money? We make money, um, our first business was, um, there was no advertising market, that had plummeted. So we had to invent something but new. But at the time you had a lot of advertising money. Not in 2000, 2001, 2002. Right, okay. There was just, it was all nothing. Okay. So we had to invent essentially a subscription model. Um, and we asked the community to spend $30 a year to buy a premium membership or a subscription. And was there anyone doing that online? Not really. Um, in fact, I, the same moment, I started a little company with a couple friends called Direct Access. And that was supposed to be essentially a gateway to build subscription models like a cable bill um, for websites. And so we could actually monetize because there was no advertising revenue. And therefore, all of my friends who wanted to make cool stuff like in cool websites couldn't do it. I was like, well, what if there was a, direct, a business that would help you guys make money I mean, I was thinking like that on the side. Kind of like the lawn mowing business. Right, so, <laughs> something. Yeah, so what if you guys could make money by having a, a package? And so DeviantArt would have a subscription model, and then this other website would have one. And we would figure out a way to have one bill, which would ultimately be a little cheaper than buying a subscription to all. 
Yeah. And, you know, and then we, you know, we didn't have OAuth 2, so you couldn't like Facebook connect, and that broke the business model down. Um, but, um, so you didn't have yeah. advertising, but you had subscriptions. Subscriptions. You created a subscription yeah. model, $30 a month. Right. And then what other? 2002, I, I, we pioneered, for sure, uh, the, uh, the prints business. So there was no way an artist could go online and sell a print. Like, there's nothing like that, especially on a one-off reproduction service basis. We didn't just launch prints. We launched prints, canvas prints. We launched uh, photo prints. We launched mouse pads. We launched all kinds of cool stuff. And it was really the first company, the first instance where this was even remotely possible. Uh, and we brought that to the community, and, and a lot of people liked it, but it was, uh, and it was a great business for us. Um, you know, but it was traditional, right? You're, we're still in, and it is a wood business, paper business. I mean, this is not very digital, it's not very internet. It was kind of you know, a, different, a different thing. So um, you know, uh, when I look back at that, I think we should have thought a little differently. Uh, it's still a fantastic business to be in, but um, it made us struggle a little bit to get that model kicked off. And then advertising eventually kicks up? Uh, advertising starts kicking in at various intervals in DeviantArt's life and in the Internet's life, really. Just, you know, there's times where it's great. and uh, There's times where it's actually ridiculous, is really the truth. It doesn't make any sense. The things are totally astronomical. And then, and then there's times where it's so basement bottom, totally horrible prices, that you just that doesn't make sense either. It's really a very unstable business um, for for a lot of uh, for a lot of folks. You can have a lot of really serious fluctuations. So when the uh, market crashes in two thousand eight, two thousand nine, how does that affect your advertising revenue? Two thousand eight, two thousand nine was dreadful, but um, you know it was uh, it was a time where we already had. So the great thing about DeviantArt was that it was built to last. It was built to live. So. You know, and it was built at the worst time possible, which is like the dot-com crash. So we learned not to depend on one business. We have multiple businesses, and they, they feed this community from prints to subscriptions to advertising. Uh, we now have a premium content business uh, where you can buy content from our members. Um, and, and these things um, really stabilized DeviantArt so that when something was going wrong over here, actually when the advertising market goes down, usually there's a recession going on and people buy more premium memberships. This is reverse psychology, but at DeviantArt, which is a community they care about, they stand apart from other members by having premium memberships. You get like a little asterisk and other people have different symbols next to their names and you get a cooler set of features on your profile page and all this kind of stuff. So, um, you know, this really uh, helps sustain the community, and in addition, people want to support DeviantArt. So if we ever write a note and say, hey guys, we really need you to buy a few more premium memberships, our community rises up and helps us. It's amazing. Um, and and what's, what's new and exciting and next for DeviantArt? The search engine I was seeing in your... Well, yeah, I mean, we've talked a lot about the, the inner guts and the sort of intensity of the, the getting the thing there. But at this point, DeviantArt is just an extraordinarily healthy uh, business. Um, it's, uh, we, you know, I think growing up helped. <laughs> you know, being, uh, being a little bit older than 19 was helpful to have a little more perspective on something as meaningful as a service uh, that, that services such a huge population of people. Really, I mean, I think it helped me. Um, and uh, what's next is um, we, we're really, really excited about a few specific segments of the community and we're very excited about our, our premium content business. It's a business in which artists make 80% of every transaction. We make 20% of every transaction. And what that means is that if you post a piece of artwork, you can sell private use rights or commercial rights for your image or your set of images or your story <coughs> and so on and so forth. So it's a platform that works for all of our galleries and all of our artists, um, but we start to actually really uh, reinforce some of those areas. So for example, the comic book industry is fascinating. Um, I find that right now is kind of a revolution in independent comics, and, um, and the platforms are there for independent comics to rise. So our premium content platform, our community of comic artists, storytellers, literature participants are soon to have a tool where they can create stories, publish stories, syndicate those stories to their, you know, iPads and iPhones, and then, uh, you know, um, ultimately uh, either give them away for free or sell them um, in, in a platform that is truly enabling to a 
demographic of artists who simply didn't have this type of utility. Only majors had that kind of access. Only if you work with Diamond could you distribute your comics and these types of things. So as um, I, I think, uh, and of course at the same time, comics are the best-selling movies in the theaters. They're what everybody loves to go see. And news stories haven't been, even been able to rise. And so I see an enormous opportunity there. I see a huge uh, kind of shift happening in that form of media, and I'm very excited about it. So I'm looking at that closely. Um, Can you talk about the search engine? Oh, of course, yes. Um, and uh, I'm obsessed with it. Yes. So we've spent a huge amount of t deviant art is a complex problem. If you guys use Pandora, I don't know if everybody uses Pandora anymore. Is that still cool? I don't know. Um, but I use Pandora, and um, and I actually influenced their subscription model. I don't, but because uh, they didn't believe in it either. And then I was like, no, it works. You have a lot of users. 3% of them will buy premium membership. And 3% of your users is a large amount of money. So <laughs> you should do that. And then they did it. And it was pretty effective. Um, not hugely crushing for them, but a great business. Pandora has a very simple, a substantially simpler problem. I shouldn't say simple at all. In delivering to you a feed of music because uh, you like this song. It's a simpler problem because the size of the library is smaller. And, and if you just think about it from just a scientific perspective, the human ear can hear a certain range of data. Let's convert like your eyes and your ears to data. If the storage that you needed to hold the, the spectrum of sound that you can hear was this much, then the spectrum, the, the amount of data that you would need to store in order to store all the data your eye can see would be like, way higher than that ceiling, right? Like, it is an insanely dense amount of data that your eye can see. And in addition to that, there's incredible things that happen with your brain when you look at images, and when you look at people, and when you look at anything. Uh, for example, um, one of the factors for what you might be attracted to in a wall of artwork is, um, is governed uh, by something simple like um, everything you've ever seen and your emotional response to everything you've ever seen. So if you saw, if you were, st you know, if you're going to get married and you get a proposal uh, at the top of a mountain that's full of snow and it's beautiful, you know, wow, it's a huge moment in your life. If you actually then see an image of a mountain the next day, you're probably going to click that, right? So that's kind of like the deterring factors. But the raw factors are um, really a lot to do with the estrogen and testosterone balance in your brain. Um, so every person in this room uh, probably has a slightly different estrogen and testosterone balance. And um, it's a huge factor in what you would be attracted to in terms of color, in terms of subject matter, and all these types so of things. So how does this search Ultimate, engine work yeah. without knowing anything about me? So tell so them what it is. is. So people can yeah. see a photo, or right, an image, right. art, and you have something, a tool that says, show me more things. Well, more like this is, is basically the beginnings of this technology. If you go to deviantart.com and you click more like this, what you're really seeing is the artwork <coughs> Uh, that people liked. But it's not as simple as that because DeviantArt every single day people go to an open wall and they click on what they like. And so they're attracted to that. And so we know that there's lots of people who are attracted to that and lots of people who are attracted to that. So if you build uh, machine learning algorithms alongside all of the human curation that's happening at DeviantArt, you arrive at the ability to project from today's submissions or submissions at any point in time uh, probably a fairly accurate feed uh, for, um, for what people like in terms of art. And I think this is extraordinarily meaningful, and it's the reason that I'm at DeviantArt 13 years, and I'll probably be there quite a bit longer. Um, you know, kind of an entrepreneur stays at something for 13, it's kind of like an intense amount of time. For most technology entrepreneurs, most of my peers have had multiple exits at this point. You know, and uh, they're going on to their next five, right? I, I am very focused on DeviantArt, and it's because um, the arts are suppressed, and it's because people don't know what they like. People don't know that they like alternative, you know, music versus, you know, kind of when you go into a store, mm -hmm. you want to... Well, I just yeah. want to make sure students have time yes, to ask course. questions. And yeah. I have to ask you one last question. Yes, of course. Or two, really quickly. So... Yeah. I remember there was a time where you really just were turned off by VCs, and you would you would give yeah. them a number when they'd call, and you'd kind of hang up on them. Yep. But uh, do suitors keep calling you to to, <laughs> to try and purchase DeviantArt? 
Um, yeah, well, yeah, this happens in tech. I mean, you, you, you have phone calls from interested people. It's, oftentimes it's, um, you know, there's private equity groups that call. There's, uh, you know, people, venture capitalists call all the time. You have, um, you have other companies that want to merge uh, or acquire you. You have, yeah, of course. So, and I know you can't share your revenue numbers now, yeah. but, you know, can you give us a ballpark idea of, you know, what a recent suitor might have offered you? Well, yeah, I mean, th these companies are, are worth hundreds of millions of dollars. So, um, you know, top 100 internet properties um, kind of are at that scale. So, you know, I think DeviantArt's value... Exactly quietly, but yeah. hundreds of millions of dollars. Right. The phone rings, people are calling you, offering you hundreds of millions of dollars. And when you raise that yeah. three and a half million, and then I think you might have had a second round, how much of the company did you have to, to give up for that? Well, at this moment, I, I won't say that specifically, but I'll, I'll tell you that um, I'm very proud of the fact, actually, because of, uh, I don't know, my issues, um, that uh, our, our employees own 94% of DeviantArt. So 6% has gone to outside investors. It's a very different path. I, I got to tell you, like it's really, really different than what most people would take as a path to investment. I don't think it was the smartest path um, for the business. At different moments, we should have funded it far more aggressively. But it worked for me, and I'm very happy with it.